Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. We're excited to continue our Executive Leadership Webinar Series with you today with Executive Leadership Coach Tim Ressmeyer. I'm Mary Vandenplas, Senior Manager of Operations here at Birchworks. Just a few quick logistics items before we dive in. Only the presenters will be speaking, so your phones and microphones are muted. There will be a short Q&A at the end of the webinar, so I'll be collecting your questions via the chat function on the left side of your screen where you can submit your questions to Tim. If you experience any technical issues, please submit those to the chat box as well. Finally, today's session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after completion. So if you missed part of it or would like to share it with a colleague, you're welcome to do that. And now to introduce Tim Ressmeyer. He's the founding partner at Ressmeyer Partners, a coaching services company, and a certified executive leadership coach. His career includes over 20 years as a quantitative executive, including senior leadership positions at Starcom Worldwide, IRI, SPSS, and Mintel. Now Tim shares his insights with executives and companies around the globe and has partnered with Birchworks to extend his considerable expertise to all of you. Uh, all over to you, Tim. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate it. Hey, it's great to be here and to be talking with all of you about a critically important topic in our industry and something we don't always think about deeply enough. Collaboration may seem like a nebulous concept to many. Is it something you can really teach? Aren't we just stuck with difficult collaborations because of the personalities involved? Doesn't it seem like someone is just going to override what the group does anyway? In school, it always seemed like a couple people did all the work and the freeloaders got away with it. It feels like the same thing now. Can I just do things on my own without having to depend on others? In the blog that was posted on March 12th on the Birchworks website, I presented 10 signs your company isn't optimizing its collaboration capabilities and six steps you can take to fix the problem. In this webinar, we'll dig deeper on the actions you can take to have more impactful collaborations. It's very common for successful employees to have spent years learning technical functions and skills, but not to have learned how to effectively collaborate on and across teams. So the topic today, we're going to look at the three stakeholders of collaboration, yourself, the individuals on the, in the rest of the group, and then the group as a whole itself. Three different ways to, to view it, the players. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some um, neuroscience, how the brain works in building trust with one another, and how the words we use make a difference. And as Mary said, we're going to have some time for live Q&A at the end. Let's jump in. Collaboration is hard. It's doable, and it starts with you. Too often we sit back and blame others, other factors as to why collaboration hasn't worked, such as the structure of the organization, the history, successes, and failures of past efforts, or the people we work with. Do we consider them lazy or uncooperative, or they have other priorities, and that messes up the collaboration? Effective collaboration starts long before you set foot in the room. There are three entities in the collaboration, me, the other individuals, and the group. Being clear on these three parts helps set you up for success in any collaboration. Let's look at the me in this equation. It all starts with you, and it's driven by confidence. Your ability to step into a collaborative engagement with confidence will influence the outcome. Well, think about this as going into an initial collaboration meeting. It can really apply to any subsequent meetings, whether they're in person, video, by phone, etc. There are two things to think about to give you confidence going in. How do I want to feel going in? And how do I want to feel coming out of that collaboration, out of that meeting? We've talked about the four faces of confidence before. Passive, mediator, aggressor, creator. Which face do you want to wear when you go into a collaborative engagement? The passive is lacking in confidence for many reasons. They let old experiences dominate, They've had bad experiences they can't let go of. They sit quietly listening to what others say. They feel things are stacked against them, and so why try? 
They show up in meetings, interviews, or relationships already expecting they cannot make a difference. Sometimes being passive is, is the choice you want to make. Too often, though, it leads to lack of accomplishing your own goals. The mediator, they look at all sides over and over, and they're always trying to please all sides. The aggressor is seen as definitive. The aggressor is clear about what they want and lets everyone know it. They get stuff done because there's no room for the opposing viewpoints or other options. This can lead, though, to bullying or the shutting down of others. They can act like a know-it-all and don't tap into the value of the entire group. The creator sees every situation as an opportunity. They know they have strength and can deliver value and impact. Even in tough situations, they're confident they can find solutions to bring about the outcome that achieves the desired goal. They keep things moving forward by leveraging their strengths and drawing out the strengths in others. You have a choice going in how you head into that collaboration. Ask yourself, what gives me confidence that I know when I go into a collaboration, I can be confident? One helpful starting point in gaining confidence is knowing your role. Why am I here? What is my role in this? Confident I can adjust as the collaboration unfolds and moves forward? Or do I feel like I'm in over my head and the collaboration might go places I'm not comfortable with? Am I prepared? Have I researched or pulled together any content I'm responsible for or know we will need? Have I prepared? Or am I passively, aggressively sitting back ready to blame other people? Finally, am I clear on the purpose of the collaboration or willing to explore and clarify with the group? Sometimes it isn't clear at the start, and that leads to confusion, scope creep, or any other problems. Am I ready to help set a proper course, or am I, again, going to sit back and blame others? Can I confidently speak up because I want it to succeed? How do I want to feel coming out of the meeting? We often don't ask ourselves this question. In my coaching, I feel it's a very valuable tool to help people have successful meetings, conversations, and presentations. Some of those feelings you might want to, want to feel at the end are, I was engaged. I was positive. I was articulate. I was curious. I was constructive. I was calm. When you think ahead about how you want to feel on the way out, it helps guide you through the interaction. For instance, if you know you want to be calm when you leave and during the meeting someone seems to be aggressive towards your point of view, what can you do to honor your value of being calm at the end? Things you might control include not taking the comments personally, acknowledging their point of view, asking for clarification, and so forth. Or if your desired outcome is to be articulate and you feel you're not being heard clearly, how can you confidently restate your point of view? To help the collaboration be successful, you also want to feel there's clarity on the next steps for you. Too often there can be wishy-washy outcomes. Do you really know what your next steps are? If not, what can you do to clarify before leaving? The second part of the equation for successful collaborations is looking beyond yourself at the other people involved. Knowing what's in it for them is a huge next step. Too often we focus on what we want out of something and don't take the time to understand the other player's point of view. When we do that, we build barriers, misunderstanding takes place, and we don't optimize the opportunity. Also, remember they are individuals. It's not just them as part of the group or the collaboration. Each one has a unique purpose in and brings unique skills to the collaboration. Ask yourself these questions. What does a win look like for them? Think about the others in the collaboration based on their title or role, stakeholders, peers, subordinates, vendors, consultants, and who do they have to answer for for the outcomes? Are they clear on the purpose and goals of the collaboration? Often collaborations, it's not managing or creating relations up or down 
like it is dealing with your boss or direct reports. It's very often creating relationships to the side as with peers. It takes a different type of leadership and awareness in each of those three relationships. What does a win-win look for all of us? It might take a little bit of thought to figure this out. What might they be concerned about working with me or the rest of my team? Thinking about that helps dial up your emotional intelligence. What information or skills can I help them with? What can I learn from them? If you don't know the answers to these questions going into the collaboration, try to figure them out. Explore them as the engagement kicks off and keep them top of mind in every interaction. Now let's focus on the group dynamic. Understanding we're in this together. What does shared success look like? We're here for a reason. We have work to do. I've thought about me. I've thought about the others. Now I'm ready to work with the group. Creating rules of engagement. I do this process frequently in my leadership team and group coaching when I'm kicking off a new program, presentation, or workshop. It's especially valuable if there's conflict or a lack of clarity of purpose for the team, or if they're a new group working together for the first time. It helps to set the ground rules for that session and can be revisited at any of the additional meetings. It's a two-step process. First, we come up together with how we will treat each other and interact throughout the collaboration. And second, we decide together how we will give each other permission to get back on track if we're not honoring those values. So step one, spend time brainstorming how you want to treat each other through collaboration. Rather than the leader coming in with a list of do's and don'ts, it's more effective if the participants agree and create the values themselves. Examples of what your group might come up with include no interrupting, paying attention, no side conversations, staying on topic, not dominating the conversation. These are a few examples of the rules of engagement that I've experienced. They seem very basic, but when they originate in the group you're working with, they become very powerful. If you're not meeting in person, additional rules might be timely follow-up. Use phone instead of email for difficult conversations, etc. They are authentic to the group and likely reflect some hints of past behavior and reflect a desire to be professional. One tip is to be sure to get absolute clarity about what the rules mean. For example, going through this exercise, people often say, hey, we should respect each other. That's too vague. What does respect mean? Keep asking each other for clarity. It might mean not interrupting. It might mean not getting personal in your comments. Similarly, not checking your phone while someone is speaking might be more specific than just paying attention as a value. Step two is about honoring the rules. What happens when the rules get broken? It's nice to say we're going to act in a certain way, but when they're not being honored, we all know that this does happen and we want to be ready for that. Spend time discussing how you will give each other permission to call each other out if the rules are not being honored. For instance, if someone is interrupting, the other team, member has, team members have permission to say, hey, Mark, you're interrupting Christy, please stop. If someone is not honoring, honoring the dominating the conversation value, members can say, Lisa, I believe you've made your point. We can move on now. If there's more you have to say, we will discuss it later. You want to do this in a caring, empathetic, professional way. You're all in this together. You can act like adults and bring about productive outcomes. Whether setting the rules for engagement or carrying out any collaboration or any conversation for that matter, matter the words we use make a difference. Neuroscience research has shown how we can increase or break off connections with people based on the words we use. Different parts of our brain are activated when we hear or interpret the things that people say to us. We need to look at this from both sides. How I hear things makes a difference, 
and how I say things make a difference. It comes down to whether you are creating trust with the person or you are creating distrust. When we collaborate, it's imperative to be aware of how we increase or decrease the likelihood of building trust. When trust is created, we can solve problems and create solutions much more easily. This actually happens chemically in our bodies. Let's learn a little from recent neuroscience research. When we first interact with someone, we make a judgment in 0.07 seconds whether we can trust that person. And in 0.10 seconds, our brain puts a label on it. If we feel someone is threatening, not listening, or demeaning us, we give it a label of mean, aggressive, or doesn't like me. This releases the hormones cortisol and adrenaline into our bloodstream. Our primitive brain kicks in, and we have less trust for the other person. This does not lead to successful collaboration. It's like a, a cocktail that's being made, and that's what this image describes. So we've got this combination of fear and stress, and that actually releases adrenaline and cortisol in our system. It's in our bloodstream. It's in our brain. And that leads us to be defensive, upset, worried, and rigid. Conversely, if the person we interact with is smiling, inviting conversation, or engaging in helpful discussion, our brain releases oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine into our system, which creates trust and allows bonding to take place. Our prefrontal cortex or executive brain is activated and we're able to establish trust, create solutions, and solve problems. Just imagine the difference that would make in collaborations. And we experience all this all the time. Some people we connect with readily, other people we shut down. And there's a chemical cause for that. And in those fear and stressful situations when that cortisol is released, that hormone that creates that negative reaction can stay in our system for up to 26 hours. It's hard to overcome, especially if it keeps building in difficult situations. So negative interaction after negative interaction, if we continue to be upset, just releases more cortisol that puts us in that position where we can't solve problems and connect effectively. So how can we increase trust in our conversations? Let's dig into the five elements of the acronym TRUST. Step one is transparency. You want to quell the thoughts and fears of the other person. How do you do this? Share concerns and desired outcomes. Create the space for the other to also share their thoughts and desired outcomes. Not engaging in the nits, not getting defensive. Acknowledge and validate their concerns. Hey, this is a difficult project we're going into. I'm not sure exactly how it's all going to play out. There are a lot of pieces involved. I'm looking forward to doing this together with you. So you're creating that transparency, that honesty. So what can you say in these conversations to help establish the space for transparency? Relationship. You want to listen to connect. There's something more important than the transaction you're discussing. You want to develop a connection or a rapport with the other person. You're engaging with them. If you shut down that relationship piece, you shut down the connection and trust is broken. What can you say verbally and non-verbally to establish a relationship with the other people? Why is this relationship important to that person? Step three, the you. Understanding. You want to listen to understand. Step into their shoes to fully appreciate where they're coming from. Listening and understanding without fear or judgment. Ask questions for clarification and to show empathy. What's really going on here? Why am I having tr trouble moving forward? Do I fully understand where that person is coming from? What words can you use to facilitate this understanding? And ask yourself, where else in your life do you find that you're really willing to listen and to learn from the other people? How can that inform your ability to listen in collaborations or other challenging conversations? Shared success. You want to listen to co-create strategies for mutual success. 
What's the win-win here? Too often we're looking at winners and losers. Why can't we both win? Create a picture of what shared success together would look like. Step away from your attachment to being right viewpoint. Be genuinely curious about different way to create something together and speak of this with the other person to help create and understand what shared success would look like. What are some of the questions you can ask to help uncover mutual success? And finally, truth-telling and test assumptions. You want to listen to close reality gaps. Telling the truth with candor and caring. Using words that invite both of you to be honest with what, you, what might be tried or what's in the way. It clears things up in the moment when you can be truthful to avoid further rabbit trails or going off on things that uh, you have to pick up the pieces on afterwards. So the first four steps here, transparency, relationship, understanding, shared success, sometimes that sounds like rainbows and unicorns and it's just you know, a little Pollyannish or we're all going to run through the meadow holding hands together. Step five, the testing assumptions and tells the truth. You've got to be able to do that. You have to be able to be clear, no, we don't have time to collect that additional data to do this. We, just, we have to hit the deadline. Or we've worked with that data before, for instance, and it just hasn't worked, so we're not going to try that again. We have to get this done, so everyone's got to work late tonight. So there are times when that does have to be, have to be clear, and truth-telling does have to take place. But if you've done these other four things, you're able to create a, an atmosphere of trust where truth-telling becomes much easier. All right, let's look at a picture of the brain. Okay. Now we're really getting deep into this neuroscience stuff. Let's how we how we we spoke about trust on that one-on-one -on -one basis. How can we think about it in a group discussion, in a group collaboration? If you look at the bottom of the picture there, you see I on the left and we to the right. And there's an arrow with listening in it. One of the goals in collaborations is move from I leadership to we leadership. And that comes through listening to the other person and being fully engaged and present. You'll see on the arc there the little triangles that show low trust, conditional trust, and high trust. We've been talking about trust. We went through that acronym. Is when there is low trust, you have difficulty connecting, difficulty making decisions, and finding solutions. So what we see here on this arc is a way to, to think about the people who you're engaged with in a collaboration. Typically, they're going to fall into one of these five categories, resistor, skeptic, wait and see, experimenter, and co-creator. So the resistor, all the way to the left, you see it's low trust, and it's all about I. I feel responsible for everything that's going on. I am defensive. I'm fearful. Whether that's you or the other person, that resistor is what, where that is manifest. I want to influence you to my point of view, and I'm not open to yours. As you move across the arc then, if somebody is a resistor, it's primarily because they don't have enough information. They don't believe what you're saying. They don't see an outcome. And so when you can start to lead them over this arc, then you can start to figure out how do I speak to these people who are falling into these different categories. So a resistor may just need information. Hey, you know, you don't think that this is going to be able to work because you've done it before, and, um, you know, the data that we're going to pull in, just, you know, you've seen that not work. What if we look at it a little bit differently? How can we try something else? Or what if we look at it slightly differently or incorporate something else? You want to move them. You can't move them all the way to being totally on board with it, but you can move them to that next step, to skeptic perhaps where there their mindset is, okay, I'm curious now. I want to learn more from you, but I'm still suspicious that you know, this probably really won't work out. Okay? You're, get, you're making some headway. You're moving them along. You've just not set up that barrier saying forget it. The next step is when you can move them to the wait and see. People sometimes will just sit back and wait and see for others to buy in before they're committing. And right there, they're like, I don't know what my value is. I don't know if I really understand this. 
But, you know, I'll, I'll see. If others start to get on board, maybe I will too. They're tentative about whom or what they want to trust there. But give them that space to figure that out rather than writing them off. The experimenter. Now you're getting into the idea of, hey, let's try these things. Let's pull that data in. Let's see if it works. Help me with this. Hey, I've got another idea here. And you know, let's test, see if it works. How can we share and discover our best current thinking? And now this is seen as someone with the courage to take risks and trust. And then finally, co-creator. Here, how can we create new possibilities together? It's a willingness to transform reality in a we-centric way. So remember, there's that we all the way over to the right. Now it's not just individuals trying to do it all on their own, feeling responsible, being the bully. You've moved into this we-centric leadership where you're willing to create, hey, it's a tough problem. I'm confident we can do something with this together. There are words that help facilitate building that trust which is, which is central to this collaboration. There are words that we use that help build trust, and there are words that help build distrust. Two different parts of our brain. And we want to look at the words we want to use more of and the words we want to use less of. So the brain can't turn on and off easily to start and stop behaviors. Instead, we talk about upregulating and downregulating certain behaviors to bring about change. On the left are the words that increase distrust in our brains. They're the words that you want to use less frequently because they create barriers. So excluding, judging, limiting, withholding, knowing, dictating, criticizing. These are the words that we want to minimize because when somebody hears them this way, it shuts down that ability to trust you. It shuts down that part of their – it diminishes trust in their brain. Chemicals are released into their system that makes them withdraw and not move forward with you. Alternatively, if you look at the words on the right, these are words that create trust and allow us to connect with others, including appreciating, expanding, share, discover, develop, and celebrate. So – Look at that. If we downregulate no, you come in, I know everything, and we're just going to do it this way. Um, I've done this before. Just follow my lead and just, just do it. Okay? That creates a barrier with the other people. Whereas when you want to discover, hey, I know a lot about this. It's been successful in the past. We're part of a team. I want to discover what you think about this. I want to share what I know and so you can share what you know. And so you're creating that space where our brains want to connect and we can trust each other and bring about more positive outcomes. So that's enough neuroscience for the day. In addition to understanding the participants in collaboration and the tools you can use to build successful collaboration, there are three additional steps to consider. Clarity, buy-in, and action. At every step along the way of collaboration, there has to be clarity, buy-in, and action. Clarity. Does everyone understand why we're here and what the next steps are? Do continuous checking in to make sure that is the case, especially at the meet end of a meeting or a phase of collaboration. Some people might be afraid to speak up. Draw that out. Some people use lots of jargon and buzzwords. What does that really mean? Ask for clarity. Buy-in. Does everyone agree those are the next steps? You might still disagree on elements of the process, outcomes, etc. But is there enough buy-in at this point that we can continue to move forward? If not, go back to the rules of engagement where you gave people permission to ask questions to clarify someone's point of view. Agreeing to disagree at this point is okay as long as it's not derailing the process. Getting buy-in also restricts team members from bad-mouthing or complaining about others in an pro unprofessional manner. Action. Does everyone know what they're supposed to do next? So often meetings end abruptly and clear action steps with deadlines and accountabilities have not been detailed. Make sure 
that those things happen, that there is our deadlines and accountabilities. Make sure this happens and it's all linked to the overall goals and timelines of the project. If it's not aligned with those, what can be done to get back on track? And who is responsible for what? Collaboration is hard. You're dealing with important stuff with groups of people you don't likely have control over. Thinking of collaboration through this lens of the three entities involved, me, individuals, and group, helps you step into the collaboration with the confidence that you can lead and participate to bring about success. And you can use what we covered today, the four faces of confidence, thinking about how you want to feel going in and coming out of meetings, the rules of engagement for setting up success for meetings, the trust model, transparency, relationship, understanding, shared su success, and truth-telling, and finally the words to upregulate and downregulate along the way to build trust that creates connections, which creates the ability to solve problems together. Those are all the tools you can use to be successful when you are collaborating. It's been a pleasure speaking with you again today. Look forward to upcoming webinars. I work one-on-one on one with individuals, leadership and executive coaching, leadership team development, advisory services, and workshops and private events. And um, welcome, I welcome anyone to reach out. Let me know what you thought about this webinar and if there's anything I can help you with moving forward. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Mary. Thank you, Tim. Of course, if you're looking to add to your quantitative or research staff, we'd be happy to speak with you and do some brainstorming about what you might have planned in terms of hiring this year. Uh, Birchworks offers contingency and retained services from entry-level analysts, researchers, and data scientists, all the way up to Chief Analytics Officer or VP of Research Searches. Feel free to send us an email if you want to chat. That's info at birchworks.com. You can also explore new opportunities or post your quantitative opportunity on our niche job board, which is trafficked by thousands of professionals in analytics, data science, marketing research, and much more. Aside from searches we're engaged on, we've recently opened up our job board to all of our clients. So if you're just looking for a new targeted place to post your ads, definitely get in touch with us. We offer several options depending on how many roles you'd like to post. And coming up soon, our first Birchworks study of 2018 with salaries, demographic data, and hiring market trends for data science. That will be coming out at the end of April, so keep an eye out. Uh, and now it's time to get to the Q&A portion. Uh, we've had definitely some great questions come in, so I want to jump in and, and get started with the first one. Uh, so we had one person ask um, that a lot of the tips you gave, Tim, can um, you know, seem fairly well mo uh, known in most, orga most organizations at the gut level, but you know, kind of in the busy day-to-day, -day, a lot of um, these tenets kind of get forgotten. So how do you kind of suggest we imbibe these tools in the genetics of an organization or team? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I'm a strong believer that the culture of an organization begins with you. So, you know, we talk a lot about toxic environments or, you know, just, you know, there, all this bad stuff goes on within, in, within companies. Um, and that's true. Um, I've been in those myself. When you start to think, though, about what is the culture I want to create, about my, create myself, around myself, what, what does that look like? So using the trust model, that, that, that acronym there, I found that to be very useful. So if you start to believe, even if people treat each other badly in an organization, I want to start treating people differently. I want to create connections with the people I work with. So I'm going to go into that difficult conversation, start out with the transparency of, hey, you know what? We haven't been getting along on this issue. And um, you know, I really want to try to figure it out with you what we can do differently because we're not satisfied with it. If you start to treat your team members that way, your subordinates, your people above you, and you go in with that confidence that I am going to try to be transparent, to focus on the relationship, to try to understand where they're coming from, look for that shared success, then that creates the environment where you can start to 
impact and diffuse some of that negativity within the organization. Ideally, yes, you want the, the top of the organization to operate in that way where they show that kind of respect for others. And if you are at the top of the organization, go for it. Start to create that culture. Um, wherever you are, though, you can start to create that culture around yourself by using some of these tools. All right, thank you. Um, and kind of uh, on a, a similar note, um, how you know in, when you're creating these rules of engagement or you know a group collaboration, how does the leader of the group emerge? Yeah, well, it, it, if there if there is an you know assigned project head or a leader, then they can implement those those rules of engagement um, and say, okay, you know we're kicking this off. Uh, one thing we want to do is just be really clear how we're going to treat each other as we go through this because it's going to be a long process. There's going to be a difficult one. So um, can we just all spend some time brainstorming how, how we want to treat each other? And so that's how it – and then how do we honor those? So if there isn't a clear leader, then be a leader and step up and say, hey, guys, before we just start doing the, 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 the nitty-gritty here, um, I, I'd really love to think about how we want to make this whole project successful and can we just decide how we want to um, deal with conflict or disagreement or you know, confusion as it comes along? Let's come up with some rules of engagement. Okay, and um, you talked about external factors that can hinder collaboration. Do you have any advice for dealing with um, unco uncooperative or lazy team members? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are always those, right? We, we, all, we all know those people. Um, there, there again, it's, you know, addressing them in a way to try to get them back on board. You know, why are they lazy? You know, that understanding piece. Why are they disengaged uh, from the process? Um, and you try to understand that. Sometimes you can't fix it. You, you can't control them. You can control your own reaction to them. You know what? If it really doesn't matter and they're, you know, not pulling their weight but it's not impacting you, so what? You know, just, just let it go. Uh, don't turn, let that turn into a real negative thing that you're, you're just griping about them all the time and with other team members, and you know, we all know where that goes. So that negativity can derail a group. So if they're not participating in a way that you want, address it or let it go. Great. Um, and also, what are some techniques to achieve buy-in? Um, you know, uh, for, with the senior leadership, and um, you know, if, if that buy-in is not, you know, fully, if they're not fully on board, what are some techniques you can use? Yeah, yeah. There again, I, you know, I, I said it. I'll say it again. Is is the trust model is just really powerful. When you go in, and it, it's also, you know, we're talking about from moving from I to we leadership. Is if I have to convince them, I have to get their buy-in. You know, if it's all about me, that becomes very frustrating. When you start to think about you know, why, why am I having trouble getting buy-in? What, what don't they understand about what we're working on or why we need something else? So they'd fall into that resistor um, side of the arc. Um, so why am I having trouble doing buy-in? So I can use a trust model to start to share that, but to also look at them a little bit differently. Rather than they're just an idiot for not supporting us, why not? What can I do? How can I speak with, with them differently, share information, help them understand confidently, engage with them and say, you know, help, why, why, why can't I get buy-in from you? You know, what, what don't you understand? And just, you know, feel confident enough to have those conversations, knowing that you want to go in using the, the conversational tools, the body language, the words, in order to invite engagement. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one final question here. Uh, so, any thoughts on uh, how to suggest the idea of creating rules of engagement or you know, what to do if any of your colleagues don't seem on board with the idea? Um, yeah, there again, it's like, you know, hey, you know, say, what, what's, what's, work, what, what's derailed our projects in the past? You know, what, what have we had problems with in the past? And you know, maybe it's not starting with the whole group, maybe, but maybe it's just one or two other members of the group. And just saying, you know what, we all hate it <laughs> when we spend time fighting or we don't get stuff done or, you know, we, we can't handle, you know, the people who derail the meetings. What can we do differently in order to make sure we're more successful? So if you start, you know, very granularly with one or two other people and say, you know, how do we want to handle this? And then try to say, you know what, I've got an idea here. Let's just open it up to the group. How do we want to treat each other? 
you'll be surprised. I mean, when I've done this with people, I'm working with a group out east, an extremely dysfunctional group. Um, and we used it, I stood up in front of them for four hours, and before we started, I used did the rules of engagement. And there was eye rolling and whatever, but in the end, they, very, they, they, they bought into it. And then we've used that in the week since to continue to say, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're speaking over people. That's violating one of the rules of engagement. So even with a group that is somewhat hostile to the idea, um, I persevered, we applied it, and, and it works, and it helps to hold people accountable. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for answering the questions. And we appreciate everyone who submitted questions today. Um, that's all the time we have. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will have a recording of this webinar up on our YouTube page later. And I hope you all have a great day.